first of all let me welcome uh, you know this panel of uh, you know esteemed leaders uh, jaya it's wonderful to see you after so many years uh, you know we've crossed roads a couple of times and uh, ashwarya and rajshri thank you very much for taking the time out to be with us on this spice money chopal uh, usha of course is one of us at spice money so usha welcome on board she's one thank of our leaders that spice money and makes sure that uh, you know we are on track on all <laughs> aspects of uh, gender equity at spice money and uh, making sure that uh, you know we are we are uh, driving inclusion on all fronts uh, so just to give you uh, you know all a quick background um, you know actually it's amazing because we are celebrating one year of this platform as well it was exactly on the same day last year that we started this uh, series called spice money chopal um, uh, the reason we call it a chopal is because we are uh, very much mentally attuned to the rural uh, ecosystem where there is this concept of chopal where people come around and have a conversation around topics which are relevant meaningful and you know everyone benefits from it so with that you know this couldn't have been a better opportunity to have four very strong esteemed women leaders on this panel i was just going through and updating myself jaya on your background now because you know you've been leading so many initiatives and of course got the opportunity to also uh, read about ashwarya yourself and rajshri yourself and i'm saying i i was just blown away with the kind of work all three of you are doing and of course usha is leading for us at spice money so maybe i could start by just uh, you know asking each of you and maybe i'll just go randomly around uh, just a quick introduction uh, just a couple of minutes on 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 what you do and more importantly how do you think about this issue of uh, you know embracing equity and empowering women in the digital age and you know you all are representative of that so more about a little bit about what you do and and um, you know uh, what excites you and what you do so rachi maybe i could start with you i i just see you first on screen there uh you're on mute are you rachi yeah am i okay yeah. now am i audible now yes perfect can hear you loud and clear please go ahead all right thank you dilip uh, it's my pleasure to be on this panel and uh, meet uh, the wonderful co-panelists here i mean you know i'm in the us i mean it's quite late for me but uh, you know i guess considering the importance of international women's day and uh, you know the the wonderful topic that you have chosen for today i thought you know it is worth staying up late and uh, be a part of this panel uh, so i am rajshree rangan i am based out of uh, chennai uh, tamil nadu in in tamil nadu india i work for fis fis is uh, one of the world's uh, leading uh, fintech provider and uh, i am the head of engineering uh, for the banking and payment solutions products for fis based in india and uh, uh, very excited to be in this panel so uh, dilip is this the question about uh, us walking through our memory lane on our journey or will you be asking it after uh, no, you maybe maybe rounds? maybe uh, no, no, rashi maybe maybe just one one interesting memory you want to share <laughs> Okay, right. I mean, you know, uh, I just completed thirty years in the industry uh, last year, so I guess uh, you know my my story uh, can be inspiring to the wonderful women who are going to be watching the session once you uh, you know uh, put it up there uh, on your channels. Uh, I my my father was a first generation uh, government employee from a very lower middle class family. and uh, after he completed his uh, domestic responsibilities and he got married he was already 35 so five decades prior uh, you know getting married at 35 was really late and uh, when my mom was pregnant the entire family was eagerly awaiting a boy uh, but they got me uh, you know a girl uh, but my dad embraced me with all love and affection and he brought brought me up the way he would have if i were a son for him right so i was taught to be bold to be confident to be brave to be fearless to dream to be ambitious to be truthful but unfortunately i lost him when i was just 14 years old so it was just me my mom and my younger sister who was just 9 years old but fortunately my mom was working uh, right so i saw with my own eyes how my mom's monthly salary was very very important for us to give three decent meals a day to give us education to give us clothing to give us shelter at that point in time i resolved that financial independence is very very important and come what may i will never never compromise on career at any point in life by the time i was 19 i joined uh, indian bank uh, a public sector bank i started my career as a banker 
uh, I was doing very well, very enthusiastic. I, I had an opportunity to learn all the parts of branch banking, but my mom got me married at 19. I became a mother at 20. Uh, uh, again, uh, you know, I think it runs in the family. I had a wonderful daughter as my firstborn. Uh, but I was very sure uh, that I did not want motherhood to stand in the way between me and my career. I was eager to get back to work after 90 days of maternity leave. My mom was working. Uh, that's when that's when my grandmother came to my rescue. She took care of my daughter. She let, she allowed me to go to work. I got myself deputed to the corporate office, so which gave me a different uh, paradigm uh, in banking, if you will. Got an opportunity to work in treasury, in, in corporate loans. I mean, in, in, a, in a big branch in their IT department, et cetera. Around that time, the new generation private sector banks were making a thing in India. So I joined IDBA Bank as one of their earlier set of employees. And, and what was differentiating the new generation private sector banks from, from the old age banks, if you will, was that they used technology as a very powerful tool to run their entire banking operations. Being that initial set, I got an opportunity to be trained uh, by the vendor of the core banking software that was power, that was powering the bank. And then I came back and we opened the branch. We, we trained a lot of people. And after a couple of years, um, we wanted to move from the core banking software to a different core banking software because we were expanding like crazy. And we wanted to get into retail banking in a big way. And we thought that we had to change our core banking software. I again got an opportunity to be uh, part of that committee or, or that panel that evaluated multiple uh, 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 core banking platforms, and then we decided on where to go. Again, I got trained, and uh, as you know, as a train the trainer, we came back, played a very important role in migrating the bank from from the current core banking platform to the new one without the customer even knowing that you know we are actually switching platforms. And then I had my another child that was a daughter again grandma to the rescue to take care of another kid in the house and then we, we we launched atms we launched phone banking and around that time i felt i was becoming more technical than functional so i i moved from uh, idba bank to one of the top it service providers in india uh, as a domain consultant in uh, their banking and financial services practice so that opened a completely different paradigm i got an opportunity to work with global financial institutions the top investment banks, uh, you know, I was involved right from pre-sales to doing a prototype uh, to uh, uh, working as a functional consultant on projects to uh, managing large programs. And then I, I thought I could do better in a product-based organization and I joined FIS. It has been 18 years since I, 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 was, since I became a part of FIS. FIS, as I told you, is the world's largest fintech and with a Marquee set of products in banking and payments. So I started as a business analyst in FIS, but soon got an opportunity to get into hardcore delivery. I mean, you know, I I have multiple times set up products in India or, or or teams that work on products in India from the scratch, scale them up. I mean, you know, did projects from small to large to super large to to very complex programs again and again. All right, but. When I joined FAS, it gave me, or rather it opened a new set of challenges for me. I'm not an engineer by education, but here I am leading a team of software engineers who are, who are developing uh, you know, superior banking and payments products from the scratch, who are enhancing with new features. So I had to upskill myself, learn a lot more from a technology standpoint, learn on methodologies that will help me to deliver faster. Learn what are the new trends, you know, that are going to be useful to useful as we start building new products. So, so I did spend a lot of time in up, upscaling myself uh, in learning technology, and then I my teams grew. I grew along with the team. I became the site leader for Chennai. I am I am a diversity champion. I participate in enterprise transformation programs, and today uh, I'm I'm so proud, uh, you know, to be the head of engineering for our banking and payments products from India and the Philippines. And I lead a team of 4,000 supremely talented professionals. My grandmother is, is no longer alive to see me where I am, but I'm sure if she and my dad were alive, they would be very proud of my journey. So what is the message uh, from, my, from my journey of 30 years to the wonderful women uh, you know, who are watching this program? You can have it all. You just need to believe in yourself.
Thanks, Dilip, for the opportunity. It was a great rewind. <laughs> Thank you, Rajshree. I could just I could just see the way you were going down memory lane, and what an inspirational story of four generation of women, starting with your grandmother, your mother, yourself, and now your beautiful daughters. And it's amazing. And Rajshree, you touched on a point of financial independence, and we'll come back to that because I think that's a very important point. And um, you know, again, at Spice Money, because we work in rural India, we really want to you know touch on this point with all of you and see see what you have to say. So beautiful, very inspirational. I, I think we need a lot more time because I can just see that, you know, we've got four amazing women on the panel and with four great stories. So uh, maybe Jaya, can I come to you and ask you to do a little bit of introduction, maybe down a little bit of memory lane like Rajshri, which is for the benefit of our audience. Sure. Um, you've asked me to speak on three of my favorite topics, women, technology and financial services. And obviously the fourth one is financial independence. So all my favorite points and having a discussion with uh, Dilip, my friend, is kind of like the icing on the cake. Um, so I am the CEO, global CEO of BCT Digital. It's a fintech company, and more so, if I may, a reg tech company, because we specialize in risk and compliance solutions, not only for banking and financial institutions, but for corporates at large as well. And uh, we also have a subsidiary which focuses on uh, sustainability solutions for large uh, corporates, ESG sustainability solutions. So before I did all of that, I'll probably try to, uh, you know, talk a little bit about memory lane. And um, so I also was a second daughter of uh, my parents and they were hoping desperately for a boy. Um, but lo and behold, uh, I was surprising from uh, quite the beginning because I could speak three languages by the time I turned one. So I don't think um, they could handle that. So they were like quite happy that I was a girl thereafter. So uh, <laughs> so it was kind of like uh, being a second daughter, there are always expectations in a sense that you start off with a disadvantage because you're born a disappointment, but then you soon try to make up for it in different ways. Um, so I think from an academic perspective, I was always kind of like academically a topper and things like that. I did my undergrad in computer engineering and did an MBA from Cornell. Uh, also did a CFA. Started my career as an investment banker. So the going was great, right? So... Um, there wasn't something that said, you know, there is going to be a stopper. I also had a kid very young. Um, so when I had the kid, as soon as I started my career, people in investment banking world in the U.S., I started in the U.S. So in an investment banking career, we're calling it career suicide. They said, are you nuts? Who have a child in their early 20s when you have a career ahead? And uh, no, my parents were quite thick, do whatever you want to do, go run the world, whatever you want to do, but get married, have a kid. That biological clock and career clock is something you have to learn to manage. Um, so that was something that I did. And it was tough because uh, from a maternity leave perspective, simple things that you wouldn't even qualify for a bonus, even if you work 11 months because you've taken a month off. That was the system in the U.S. Um, so it was not so much about the bunny, but the fact that you take a career break, even if it's just nine days off it. So what did I do? I knew that I couldn't be working 18 hours a day, even if I had my uh, mom to support, again, women to the rescue of other women. Um, it was more a question of what do I do to kind of do lateral things rather than keep in the spot running, rather than kind of like saying, I will only do investment banking. I'm not going to go. I'm great at it. I'm going to do only that. I chose to move laterally. Uh, I moved to HCL Technologies and started with their big deals team. So that was something purposely career move was designed to look at, can I kind of like stay in place? Whether it's New York, you know, can I be in New York and kind of like still take care of a child? So that was a fundamental decision. So I moved there. I was heading their big deals team. But as luck would have it, there were a lot of deals I could source. So from a perspective of like running it, $100 million deals, there was a $780 million deal that I was kind of managing and setting back, which meant I was still living out of a suitcase. So a lot of travel early on, and that was challenging with a young family. And most of my career moves 
were uh, dictated by what was needed at home at that point of time. And it was kind of like moving laterally. Um, and I put up my hand up. I think one of the good things that I would also advise women is to not limit your um, uh, career progression to what you think is the possible. Because once you dream big, once you kind of like say, I will learn to prioritize this and balance things, and you put your hand up and you volunteer, things just fall into place. And if they don't, you still can manage because you would then decide what's the next move at that point rather than holding yourself back. I think that's a very important message that I would draw from my career as a whole. Then when Accenture was headhunting, we won HC, at HCL, we won it, the deal against Accenture, which was the incumbent. And I was headhunted by Accenture to lead their um, financial services uh, group. And that was a big move. I chose that also because that would give me an option um, to kind of be based out of India. So I moved from the US to India at that point of time. And I was part of the seeding team for Accenture in India. That was the story. And then every move that I moved on was presented by some, you know, parallel happenings at home. And uh, when I was in, uh, when my son was in ninth grade in high school, I was tired of like jumping every four years in a bank. You'll have to roll rotate every four years and move to a different location. And my son being a complete academic said, I'm not moving out. I want to finish in one location. So that was presented by this entrepreneurial journey because nine years ago, I said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm done with kind of doing other corporate-ish things. And that started my journey of uh, setting something on my own. And as he moved on to like college and other things, he moved on to UC Berkeley and did other things. I think that I kept on the entrepreneurship journey. And I'm so happy that it has a fundamental impact, the journey, not only on kind of saying uh, important messages, focus on what are top priorities, let go of smaller ones that don't matter and stay focused and run the race your own special way. Each person's journey is unique and I think staying on the track is going to be quite important. Um, and today, this uh, whatever we do, I wanted to look at Make in India as something that was a fundamental component. Even nine years ago, before it became fashionable to be Make in India, and that was something we fundamentally said, make in India, make a difference for the economy, for the people at large, and then do reverse innovation, which is make in India and roll out to the globe. So it is, you know, grow local and then float it uh, globally. So that is uh, a short summary. And uh, I also serve on multiple boards and also look at diversity and inclusion as a key component, UTI, asset management, PwC Global, I sit on their global uh, board, uh, Indigrate to name a few. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm sure all the women and others who are listening and going to be uh, Dina, seeing this panel will see what inspiring leadership uh, Dina, people like all of you are providing in your in your journey. And um, Jaya, you touched on a couple of points. You touched about this aspect of how do you manage between work and family uh, do you know something you don't hear men talking about, right? As much yeah. about, you know, as women talk about it when they have their kids. I don't see men introducing themselves saying, I've had a son and I've had a daughter. They'll generally just talk about their work. They'll not talk about their home. Um, and, uh, you know, how you do this and how you manage this. And I, and the other sec next point, which I think we should come back to in addition to financial independence is reverse innovation. Uh, because, you know, how do we build homegrown innovations in the financial services space for women? Um, you know, across the board. And uh, I, I know that there's a lot of work happening in that space. Would love to get your minds on it. Uh, you know, I would just have this panel on introductions. I think this is so amazing just listening to your stories. I, you know, this is so inspiring in itself. I think this could just be the panel in its own. Uh, but Eshwarya, sorry to keep you waiting. Can I come to you? And I know at Kinara Capital, you're doing your bit to drive inclusion and credit into society. And otherwise, uh, would love to hear your story, Eshwarya. Sure. First of all, thank you for the opportunity. It's wonderful to meet uh, like-minded women and given the opportunity to give a message out there to the larger women out there who are waiting to figure out how to get to the top. Um, and thank you for that opportunity. So first of all, um, I'm the CFO at Kenara Capital. Kenara Capital's main goal is to give financial inclusion to all business owners out there in the MSME segment without land or property collateral at the last mile. So uh, the concept of what we drive is financial inclusion at the lowest level in terms of how do we enable 
all pockets of the segment to get access to credit and hence as an ecosystem we grow um my personal journey um, I, is really inspiring to hear both um, Rajashree and Jaya, really fantastic journeys um, and also a lot of learnings from how they have gone through life. So I'll try and add my bit so that if it helps anybody, it's great. Um, this year's theme actually is Embrace Equity and I would like to you know, sort of take that journey in that mindset because I've had the great opportunity to having that equity from the start in my life. Now, how did this happen? It happened from all of the dinner tables, all of the inclusions, all of the conversations, which I was a part of. So I come from a South Indian Tamil Brahmin family, usually um, labeled as conservative, but the kind of opportunities, the kind of inclusion, the kind of talks which I was exposed to and the opportunities given by my parents were significant. Those were the building blocks which has made me right now stand here today. Um, I have a younger brother, but the kind of equity even at that level was significant. It was very different. Uh, the kind of talks we had in the dinner table is why I love financial services. My dad is a banker. And most of our dinner table talks used to be about issues at office and how he sort of solved things and how some loan had to go here and there. So what I've heard from way young, when I was way young was banking, financial services, money. So it's sort of, you know, in my blood and I've grown up listening to all of these talks and I've, and what made the difference was that my views counted, my views were taken up and that sort of made the biggest impact and the biggest change. So I would say that equity started there, right there for me. So the opportunity to be heard and the opportunity that my views counted were sort of an assuming block in my psyche, which then, you know, made me start dreaming big in terms of what I would like to become when I grow up. And with that in mind, of course, financial services obviously led to the CACS pathway. So I'm a chartered accountant as well. Uh, you can call it cliche today, but when, you know, I started out on my journey of studies, this was the path you needed to take to sort of, you know, get something into financial services. You needed to be a CA. So that's the only route. But with things opening up today, you have a wide avenue. I mean, the kind of material you have today was nothing compared to what we had, but still CA was the course I chose because um, of all the background I had and uh, uh, really the kind of equity there we got as students. Um, I did my coaching from Bombay where uh, uh, CA coaching was like a big thing, but uh, male, female, there was no distinction. The kind of coaching, the kind of preferences, the kind of opportunities given there, again, made me believe that you can become something at a later point in time. And as my career started growing, I started out with ITC, which was having a multi-diversified portfolio and the inclusion in terms of the businesses of ITC was tremendous. So that was the starting point of my journey. Then going on to JMR group of companies where again, the exposure in terms of a different level of strategy and planning was uh, very instrumental in where I am today. And eight years ago, uh, financial services came into the path wherein um, Kanara Capital happened. Uh, I was given an opportunity again by a women founder, Hardika Shah, and um, in a space which I really loved and which I thought this, if not this time, then this is the time to figure out if this is there in my blood. And I jumped into financial services, joined Kinara Capital when it was about 35 odd crores of AUM. And eight years down the line, we are at 2,500 crores managing a significant AUM and over 125 branches. And um, the last five years, what the sector has gone through is not something where any book could have sort of taught anybody about. And I'm supremely happy because this is sort of equated at the highest level across all genres of whether it's a women's CFO or not, you're being given the same ecosystem to run and deal with of all of the pitfalls, what it can come with. Starting with demonetization, GST, LFS crisis, code wave one, wave two now, if this was not a sort of black swan five years, nothing else would be. So um, I had the opportunity to be completely having that equity among different pockets of my ecosystem. But um, what I would like to give as a message to the women out there are three things. 
Number one, um, opportunity. Wherever there is an opportunity, you need to grab it. You need to figure out how you can use it. Um, equity is not an assumption. Unfortunately, still, we all talk about equity. But uh, in the realistic sense, it is not an assumption. Uh, you need to state your claim. So wherever there is an opportunity, grab it. Secondly, uh, work-life balance. Um, I think Jaya did touch upon all of that. I have a daughter and um, work-life balance is something we need to figure out. It is not an either or. There is a happy combination. If you figure that happy combination, how can we uh, achieve both equality there is something which we uh, should strive for. And the third thing, vision. So have vision for yourself. Have vision as a personal, as an individual of where you want to reach and then try and achieve those targets. Thank you. Thank you, Aishwarya. Wonderful, wonderful messages and wonderful theme of starting with saying equity at home. And I think uh, that really makes a big difference, right? How much are you included in your conversations? And uh, we work a lot in rural India. And, uh, you know, we've we've worked with women who've never stepped out of their homes, uh, yet they are the ones who are working in the farms and, you know, taking care of the cattle at home and doing a lot of things. So we'll come back to this point of equity at home and what we can do with it. Maybe we quickly round up with you, Usha. Uh, I know I know you a little bit more than the others, but um, I, I know you're a very committed daughter to your mother. Uh, so, so Usha, a, a, a little bit on your story before we get into some of the topics in the next half an hour. Sure. Thanks a lot, Dilip. And uh, it's really a wonderful meeting, uh, you know, these uh, power women on this panel. And thanks for the opportunity. I think very quickly, uh, you know, about myself, uh, um, I joined the banking sector at uh, a very young age of 19. And since I was a good student, uh, you know, my college principal, he said, okay, go for it and I'll give you the attendance. So I did not lose on my education. I used to get all the support on my education at MES College, one of the leading colleges in Bangalore, uh, by virtue of the equity that I had already created by being a good and sincere student. And uh, of course, uh, you know, a young and quick start in the banking sector. I come from a middle class family where education uh, was the gateway to a bright future. And this is something that has been ingrained in our heads uh, right from birth. And in fact, uh, there was no age bar for learning. And I still remember when I did my ICWAI way back in 1986, uh, you know, my brother, me and my dad also sat for that exam because he wanted to kind of challenge his children that at that age he can still learn. So I think that's been inspirational and I've continued to do that, uh, uh, you know, right uh, till date. So there's been uh, last year uh, I did my master's in uh, scriptures and then I did something in Sanskrit. So there's, there's been a continuous learning which has been ingrained in the DNA probably because of the middle class, um, you know, Tam Bram background to which I belong. Uh, of course, I met my husband in Central Bank and, um, you know, I've been blessed, I would say, with a supportive, very, very supportive family where uh, gender bias um, is not much of a challenge as in rural India. So I think I would say that I've been blessed on that count. I've always dreamt of a world where there would be equal opportunities for everyone. And I do believe that the world is a stage and you choose wherever you want to go, wherever, whatever you want to do. But always it's very important to anchor yourself and come back to your family. Um, and uh, coming to the family, as I mentioned, my husband uh, also from Central Bank of India. And uh, that was, I would say, a blessing in disguise because uh, we, we did not have challenges of... Uh, working in separate locations. We were always transferred together wherever we went and we've been through the length and breadth of this country uh, because uh, I completed more than two decades and he's worked for three decades with Central Bank of India. So I, uh, I'm blessed with uh, my daughter, Deepti, who's, uh, you know, um, another, uh, I would say, uh, inspiration in herself in the way she has uh, you know, fought adversities and a very poor academic record to kind of make it uh, big in the US for herself. So I think uh, a matter of pride uh, and uh, at work, of course, there have been challenges uh, of, you know, transfers, uh, balancing a demanding work environment with home. 
um, all of these, uh, I think every stage uh, we have to make conscious choices and uh, very important that we don't regret anything that we do. So initially I made conscious choices of prioritizing family over my career um, for, uh, you know, um, very valid reasons. Absolutely no regrets on that. Uh, in 2008, uh, I decided to jump to the private sector and uh, there's been no looking back. So I've had the, I would say, uh, you know, distinction to work with all kinds of banks in India, uh, right from, uh, you know, private sector banks, uh, foreign banks. I had an opportunity to go abroad for a short stint uh, with an international bank. And then uh, by the time I came back, India was changing and uh, we had differentiated banks, small finance bank. I got the opportunity to be the first CRO and then uh, payments bank. And as a natural progression, here I am with Spice Money because uh, I love uh, what Spice Money is doing in the rural space. It's very close to my heart. And um, the last seven or eight years, I would say, have been, uh, you know, very closely intertwined uh, with the uh, digital, uh, let's say, uh, revolution in India and the deep impact it has on Bharat. So I think every role has been a learning experience. And uh, I would say that I'm still learning and, uh, you know, I'm just uh, looking forward to every day of uh, new things and uh, new ways in which we can uh, make a difference to the world where we live. I think uh, uh, that would be, a, you know, a quick take on my small journey and where I've reached today. Yeah. Thank you so much, Usha. I think you touched on this theme of you can learn at any age. And I think that's such a beautiful thought. Um, you know, congratulations on on continuing with that mindset. Uh, so with that, uh, ladies, I think, uh, you know, if we can, I, I know that there's a lot of technology knowledge on this panel and as well as, uh, you know, financial services and banking. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, what I want to start with is this concept of financial independence. And I think, uh, you know, while it applies across the board, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion around, um, especially we work in rural India, right? And we work in in the aspect of driving financial inclusion in rural India. There's a lot of work around priority sector lending in, in rural India. Now, uh, the reason I bring that up is because when we talk about financial independence, I think it applies everywhere. But I think if I was to just come to the rural context, uh, you know, that we operate in and ask you, uh, ask you all to step outside of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, but just given your experience and the power of technology and, uh, you know, to drive inclusion, uh, you know, how do we see, uh, you know, financial independence for women happening in rural India? I know our government started with this concept of opening bank accounts and driving money into the bank accounts of women, uh, you know, so they can get access to the money. We know about the microfinance industry, how it has targeted creating these joint liability groups with women in rural India, but we don't really know that when they take the money, you know, do they use the money for themselves or does the man of the house use the money for something else? You know, what is the end use of that money uh, going forward? So, so the idea is that, you know, how can maybe technology help solve for this? Uh, you know, uh, what are the areas that we can focus on? So maybe just any thoughts, uh, you know, around the room around, you know, how do we, how do we think about financial independence for women in rural India. Any ideas, any thoughts, suggestions? Anyone, we could just start, you could just raise your hand or we could just go around. Yeah, Jaya. So I think when it comes to financial independence, I will today focus more on rural women, but I wanted to pub, uh, look, you know, talk about an interesting survey. There was this talk show that was done where they kind of like had a lot of statistical evidence and they interviewed the rural women and the urban women. Interestingly, the urban women do not have access to their bank accounts, even though they're working. Their deb debit cards are with their husbands. And it's, it's more a component of, I do not know what investment is. I do not know what are the platforms. These are working women in technology, in different kind of like forward-looking arenas. And yet they do not have, have access to their own accounts. Compare and contrast that with rural India, where once you start working and you say, my money is my money, and to an extent, the man's money is also your money. That is what the survey said, because, you know, the concept of money and the man being the breadwinner is a well-established rule in rural India rather than in urban India. 
So I also want to talk about the urban divide when you mentioned the point to say that there needs to be parallel stream of promoting digital literacy. We need to educate them on what the financial instruments are. How do you invest wisely? So a lot to focus on. For the urban people, it's different mode, modes of methods of communication. Like, for instance, when you talk about the urban women, we do in our office, we have like a, as part of the DNI, we have a program called Water, which is all about empowering women. And we had classes for them on how to file their taxes, believe it or not, to talk about how do you invest your money? What are SIPs? What are the ways to kind of look at, um, you know, investing in different alternative methods? What is the rate of return? How do you kind of look at it? This was something we had to talk to women who have been in employed in the workforce between zero to 20 years. So where is this concept of financial independence? Now, let me kind of move to rural India. I think the problem is slightly more, if you focus, you can solve that much more faster, is my honest opinion. Because they are empowered enough to say when they are working, they have their own accounts to kind of say, what do I do with this money? Right. So in that, what do I do? I think it's more about giving the right tools to them. You talked about the CFO and the CTO being different. I think once you bridge the gap and give them promote digital literacy, I think that is one of the easiest bridges to cross. It's about now. First thing was how do you create bank accounts for them? Next is how do you use the bank accounts without fear or favor? How do you kind of like say, how do I invest this? How do I apply for loans using this? How do I use, build a simple, whatever is needed, if you need a business plan to be submitted, even for a credit, how do you kind of do that? So I think it's a lot to do about mentorship. It's to a lot to do with fundamental digital literacy. It is a lot to do with education on the financial tools available. And it's more about the environment that helps them kind of stay course and take them all the way. Uh, I think there are two kind of like, it's an important part for both groups. But I think it's more the means in which you render that is different for both groups. But the fundamental problem still remains that India is, as a whole, not financially independent from a woman perspective. Yeah. Well, thanks for that, Jaya. Uh, Rajshri, how do you see, do you know, technology, use of technology? Do you know, you, you, you're you heading banking and payments, uh, do you know, at FIS. Uh, do you see technology helping drive this aspect of digital and financial literacy that... Uh, Jaya spoke about and how we can empower rural women with financial products and knowledge of financial products? Yes, of course. Uh, so, I mean, as you right, rightly mentioned, uh, Dilip, I mean, India right now is at the forefront of a global fintech revolution. And women, for sure, are steadily uh, making a place for themselves in the industry, slowly but steadily, uh, right? I mean, you know, I, I just read a research data that says that in the last decade or so, more than 200 fintech and financial services startups have been founded by women as a founder or as a co-founder. So Mobiquick is an example which is now bound for an IPO, right? But these numbers seem progressive, but I do agree that there is a lot of work to be done. And fintech can definitely provide this opportunity of bridging, you know, the divide between urban India and rural India as far as financial inclusion and literacy is concerned. The finance gap for women-owned small businesses in India was $158 billion in the last two years. Most women-led businesses have to finance themselves or they have to opt out for informal credit options because banks and other financial institutions are a bit unsure of the business models and the potential of guaranteed returns on loans you know, to, to women-led businesses. The government and the formal financial institutions have launched a lot of schemes. And then, uh, we spoke about right Jan Dan Yojana for financial inclusion. I think it is important to meet the specific business needs of women-owned businesses. Nari Shakti scheme, right, which funds women entrepreneurs by providing soft loans. Women in Engineering, STEM and Technology, the West program that encourages women uh, to pursue education in STEM subjects. Uh, women and Women Entrepreneurship Platform, right, which is an access portal that brings together an ecosystem for women. I think all of this have contributed significantly towards enabling women in India to realize their entrepreneurial aspirations. But again, a lot needs to be done from a rural India standpoint. Speaking on, you know, what fintech can do, right? I mean, you know, fintechs with their custom-built API-based platforms, 
superior AI ML, artificial intelligence and machine learning based algorithms. They have, you know, they have this liberty to access numerous alternative source of data. You know, it could be GST, it could be mobile data, it could be social media, it could be statutory payments, litigations, whatever, right? And analyze them through thousands and thousands of data points. This can make credit underwriting assessment robust and easier for lenders and thus enabling financial inclusion for, you know, the people that are in, in rural India are in Bharat today. I think it is a two-way street for the growth of women, uh, you know, uh, in, in fintech especially. Fintechs have the ability to step in and help in rapid calculation of credit worthiness, allowing, uh, you know, women entrepreneurs from rural backgrounds to access hassle-free and easy credit options, which in turn can empower them financially to, to get ahead in their career, or rather, you know, bridging the gap between the CFO and the CTO, as you rightly put it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rajshri. I think this point about, uh, you know, women-led businesses, right? And, and you know, whether you say the micro-businesses, small businesses, uh, Ashwarya Jaya spoke about reverse innovation, homegrown solutions, right? I, I think the question is, how do we build homegrown solutions for women-focused financial products and solutions? Maybe starting with credit and savings and investments. Uh, just to share with, with, you, with you all, um, you know, we are seeing women in rural India wanting to you know, embrace even agri tech as a as 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 uh, you know as an opportunity. You know, to to enable growth in uh, agri income, right? So, is there a way, Ashwarya, that uh, you know there could be women focused financial products? Uh, you know that that we could we could work on uh, as an ecosystem mm -hmm. and and target women with that. Uh, you know, and with with. The point that Rajshri made about AI ML, there's so much flexibility with technology, right? Like we've gone from EMI products to EDI, right? Daily deduction versus monthly deduction. So is there a way, um, Ashwarya, that we can innovate for women-focused financial products? Sure, thanks for the question. And I think it's a great question. And I'm so glad that we've moved away from the question of awareness or literacy for women to financial products for women that is showing a key change even in our thinking in terms of where the women are already out there now to answer your question directly on whether there could be financial products for women absolutely at kinara for example we do women tailored business products we call it harvikas now what we do there is um we try and lend money to business entrepreneurs who are women who are focused on the business who want to drive inclusion and who want to expand their business and we have a separate product for them and we give credit to them now Rajeshri mentioned AI and ML and how you know we can underwrite them better the the fundamental problem we've realized for underwriting of women or women-owned enterprises has primarily been data now data for women historically, culturally, at least in India, has been very limited. And that stems from the problem of how a man of the house always owns all of the pieces of, you know, income generation or the asset, etc. And how the women mostly are excluded. But we are seeing that change over time. We are getting more data to underwrite the women out there. We are getting a lot of um, uh, assessment data on these women, which is helping us to create products specifically focused on the women. And in fact, we actually give them a discount on whatever is the interest rate we charge to others because we want to motivate and bring all of the women entrepreneurs on board. Now, what needs to change there to ensure that as an ecosystem across all segments we move is how the women out there can assess themselves better, get opportunities from different players out there, access these markets so that they are aware of whatever is out there. Internet has played a huge part in terms of educating all of the women of what is out there. There are a lot of platforms right now who do um, small wealth management courses and financial inclusion courses, etc., which sort of educate these women so that they also know how to manage their own businesses. Now, even if they have great ideas, they are unable to find the capital to sort of support them. So as an ecosystem, first of all, we need to ensure we give them credit, assess them better, and give them a history with which they can leverage it better at a later point in time. Uh, but in terms of funding, we are also seeing that there's a lot of focus being made on women-owned businesses and funding directly to women-owned businesses. There's a lot of interest in the Indian market 
and the uh, uh, international market to uh, focus on gender based investing which if used correctly can reach all of these women out there and help them grow in their own careers and in their own financial products segment as well so we as an ecosystem have a lot of work to do but what is definitely true is all the women out there are uh, equally uh, eligible to access whatever platforms whatever credit whatever opportunities are out there and we need to figure out a way to help reach our products to the end women borrowers i think um, ashwarya just building on what you said uh, two points that come to my mind one is that we all talk about low npas in the microfinance industry and how you know the 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 front end of the microfinance are the women uh, joint liability group so obviously data shows us that uh, you know if you lend to a woman, there's a good chance you'll get your money back, right? So the collection uh, track record of MFIs has been very good, uh, you know. So so therefore, you know, why this lack of confidence to drive more credit, right? When when they say the the challenge with credit is collections, and the NPAs are the best uh, in the in the microfinance business where where women are taking a lead. The second point is around women oriented businesses, and I guess uh, you know the point about data, uh, Ashwari, that you made. Because how do we move from secured lending to unsecured lending? Now we know about gold loans, right? And how, you know, that has been a big segment. Uh, you know, a lot of informal lending and all the gold is owned by the woman in the house, for example, you know, in rural India and otherwise, and how that is used to get credit. But also how do you move beyond secure to unsecured lending, which is cash flow based lending? And that's where women who are starting small businesses, whether in rural and urban India, how can we can build models you know, around being able to determine these uh, the, the robustness of those cash flows and how we can figure out a way through digital platforms to, you know, root those cash flows in a manner where more and more NBFCs can come in and root and, and provide capital. So there is, this, there is yeah. this initiative of the government, the Open Credit Enablement Network, and I would really call on the entire ecosystem to say how we can, you know, really within that have a focus around women-focused financial products, right, where you have NBFCs innovating and then you know there are lots of women who are being brought on digital platforms to be able to access uh, loans right um, I, right. I think. yeah so. well said actually because uh, what we do is unsecured lending and this has enabled us to create even the history for these women based enterprises right now about 10 to 12 percent of our lending is to such women borrowers and you brought a great point of npa we see nothing different women non-women it is about the business's ability to repay and not who's sort of, you know, running the business. And if you have a good business model, regardless of gender or otherwise, it's about credit underwriting of the business. To some extent, the proprietor, but beyond that is what we need to sort of pierce the veil. Yeah. And I know before we uh, go towards uh, summarizing our conversation, Usha, you know, you've been working at Spice Money with the Adhikari Merchant Network that we have and the role that our women Adhikaris are playing within this network. Uh, Usha, you want to share your experience? I know, you know, it's far and few right now, but what do you see that as we get more women coming into the merchant network and delivering financial services, can they help us innovate for women in their community around financial products? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, the business model of uh, Spice Money itself, it is a great enabler for financial empowerment of the underserved segments in rural Bharat. So clearly, uh, you know, by creating this network of Spice Money Adhikaris, we are enabling women to make their own living, to become financially empowered. Not only that, I think the very important part uh, of this entire journey is the increase in self-esteem of the woman, which empowers her financially because she's providing services to others in her, uh, you know, neighborhood. But at the same time, uh, it is, um, you know, one is financial and the other is it raises the self-esteem uh, as well, both both ways, because she's able to help others to avail these services. I think women empowerment uh, uh, and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, uh, uh, it has to be reimagined and uh, it has to be beyond, uh, I would say, financial literacy and uh, uh, beyond uh, all of this, because uh, um, very important uh, that uh, we should curate products for women. And this is where I think the government uh, of India has been, uh, you know, doing a great um, job in terms of rural focused initiatives. So you just spoke about uh, 
you know, Oaken, uh, which is, uh, you know, credit enablement network. Um, we also touched upon ONDC, which is the, uh, you know, online uh, digital commerce uh, platforms. So I think all of these um, and, uh, you know, Spice Money's participation shoulder to shoulder in these initiatives and taking it to the deep rural pockets. These are all enablers as far as, um, you know, women are concerned. So um, just an example, I think through Oaken, uh, where, uh, you know, uh, not only Spice Money, there can be a lot many others uh, who can become lending service providers. Um, I think um, if, uh, you know, the lenders... Uh, specifically the NBFCs, if they reimagine the products and start offering customized products to the lady of the house who can avail a loan for the tenure of just say one day to buy fish, sell it and repay it the same day. I think that is um, the revolution that we are going to see. And uh, it is indeed a matter of pride that uh, we at Spice Bunny are going to be, uh, you know, uh, walking with the government uh, through all of these initiatives um, to ensure that, uh, you know, credit in the way it reaches by way of, uh, you know, customized products, uh, by way of, uh, you know, targeted uh, delivery of credit. Uh, I mean, you call subsidy the targeted delivery of credit. I would say that token should be the new word where you can target um, and uh, reach the funds where it is required at competitive rates of interest. And as you know, everyone in this panel rightly said, there has been, uh, I would say, better repayment record uh, by women entrepreneurs uh, through self-help groups, or rather that it has not been worse just because they are a woman. It's more about the business model, as Aishwarya said. So I think uh, participating with the government on all of these initiatives, another one to mention is the ONDC. Again, a rural woman, you know, can uh, sell homemade stuff to any corner through ONDC. And she does not have to depend on an Amazon or anything like that. At competitive rates, she the market has opened up for her. The, you know, the entire country has become a market. Only, uh, you know, once we fine-tune the logistics and the delivery and the service delivery and all of that, I think... Uh, uh, you know, the opportunities, uh, sky is the limit. That's what I would say. And um, I think uh, visionary strategy, um, it, it will help uh, rural women to integrate into the mainstream and uh, reduce their dependencies on money lenders, help them to earn their own income to support themselves, their families. I think uh, this is how I look at it, Dilip. Thanks a lot, Usha. I know we've run out of time on this uh, panel, but... Uh... This is such an amazing topic that I would love to invite all of you for a second discussion around this. But I think I would just like to conclude by saying that, you know, if we have an ambition to, you know, grow the GDP of our country, not just to $5 trillion, but $10 trillion, you know, we have to include over 50% of our population, which is the woman, uh, both in urban and rural. And I think both digital and financial empowerment can make it happen. Uh, you know, we've heard from four power leaders on this panel of how, you know, there are examples of women starting from humble backgrounds and then getting into leadership positions, uh, you know, and, and driving message of equity, both at home and at work. I'm sure that everyone who's listening to this and has taken time out to listen to this panel will be inspired by these four amazing stories. And uh, we just hope that this is a start of a conversation that will lead to, uh, you know, inclusion, uh, you know, at all levels. Uh, so let me thank all of you wonderful leaders, uh, Jaya, Aishwarya, Rajshri, Usha, for taking time out and sharing with us such inspiring stories. May you continue to lead from wherever you are. May you lead at home, may you lead at work, may you lead in society and help us truly unlock the potential that is still locked up both in urban and rural India, which is women still in the house. We have to get them out and we have to make sure that they contribute towards growth of our amazing nation. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope that we can stay connected. Thank you for your time at Spice Money, Chopal. And I hope all of you have benefited from the short discussion we had. I surely have benefited and I'm inspired by all of you. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.